would just like to thank everybody for having me, for inviting me. It has been four years since I first have been here in South Africa, and I've got uh, the pleasure uh, to know a lot of people already, uh, and to see how driven people are, how enthusiastic people are, um, but also how integer people are. It's, uh, you have ambition, I think a lot, uh, but you combine it with a very natural way of approaching things, of approaching people as well, and I'm very happy I can be a small part of this big family. So thank you very much for having me. And what I would like to share is, uh, I think, a little bit of the knowledge I uh, grew uh, while doing research also with uh, Professor De Witte and others uh, in Belgium and all over the world. And uh, it's mostly about motivation, because that uh, is something I'm really keen on and I really want to study. And um, why study motivation? Why study it when there is an economical crisis? Why study it when everything goes well uh, in organizations? Why is motivation so important? Well, I think it's very important because it's about people. And people make the difference. And therefore, I think it's my duty as a researcher to really study what can make people very motivated. What can help them to perform well while feeling well as well. So really thriving, uh, that's uh, my main goal. And, um, I really would like to introduce one motivational theory. I would like to share this one in particular. There are others, so if you feel at the end of the lecture this is not the theory you want to work with, that's okay. There are plenty of others. But I would like to share this one in particular because I think it's a grand theory. It's a big theory, it's not only a reason, but also a very big one. So it can help you in uh, motivating employees, for example, I think for the rector, and uh, so on. It's very important to motivate teachers. But if you're a teacher, you can also uh, use this theory to motivate your students. And if you have a husband or a partner or a wife, and you want him or her to do the dishes, you can also use STT. So I think you might uh, want to take something along uh, this evening. And what I also like about STT is that it has different aspects of motivation. It's both about what do people, uh, why do they do what they do, which kind of goals do they strive for, and what is the energetic force that they really need. So all these aspects are part of one theory, which makes it very uh, broad and perhaps sometimes a little bit difficult, but also it gives you a broad view of which uh, things you can work on if you want to motivate others. Interesting about SET is that it's a recent theory combining a lot of aspects that have been prevalent in other theories, like for example, goal setting theory, here's a part of goals uh, in SDT as well. But it also adds to the, the other uh, theories, in the sense that it looks at the quality of motivation. It's not so much how much you are motivated, because you can really be motivated in the wrong way. It's like, it's not that uh, if, if you are lost or if you are uh, dwelling in a city, it's not how hard you can run, but how hard you can run in combination with do you know the right way, because otherwise you're running in the wrong direction. And that is what SET also does. It gives us some guidelines how to motivate uh, students or employees in a good way and a lot. So also direct them to the high quality of motivation. And when I explain SET, I can um, bore you with five different mini theories and explain all the different details of them, but that's not what I intend to do this evening. What I would like to uh, walk you through is four important concepts. First, the meta theory, how does SDT think? as a theory, what are the basic assumptions, how uh, does it look at uh, why do people what they do, how does it uh, say something about the goals we are trying to achieve and what is the needs of, that are driving us, what is the energetic force underlying all these aspects of motivation. So only four things. So if you are more like a visual person, think about the blue goals, the uh, purple squares and the green goals for the different uh, concepts. So, okay. But let me first ask you a question to introduce you the meta theory of SET. If you're sitting here and if you're thinking about yourself, is it that you sit here because you feel controlled? Is it you had to be pushed to sit here? Is it also the case that you just sit here and I stand here and yeah, that's the way it goes. Everything I do will influence you, but not the other way around. Or are you growth oriented? Are you here because you're active and you want to learn something? You want to say, like, hmm, perhaps this is something interesting, she might tell us. 
or perhaps it's good to be part of the community and to come and see uh, which new members we can welcome and stuff like that. And is it also the case that how you frown and how you smile and stuff like that will also influence how I stand here? Is it a one-way or two-way direction? Well, this is not something we can know for sure. But what SET knows for sure is that SET starts off with a positive view. Like if we look at people in a positive way, we can motivate them in a total different way than if we think they are uh, not active, they are passive, they are reactive, and we need to control them. Or if you want to have it in pictures, <laughs> SET starts off with the other donkey. It's not this donkey, and I already took the, the nice perspective because I also could have chosen the stick. No, SET is about uh, not even the carrots, it's about the other donkey. Do you know what donkey is? Yeah, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Donkey Fred is very active, wants to do a lot of things, so you just have to steer him in the right direction. You know, you just have to give him small guidelines, and then he will flourish. Well, that's the starting point of SET as well. So that was already the first thing, the meta theory. Think about people in an active, growth-oriented way, and you will achieve much more than when you think of them in a controlled way. Then let me take you to the second aspect of SET. And can I then ask you a personal question? You don't have to raise your hands if you don't want to. It's just perhaps a personal one. Why are you sitting here? What is your motivation to be here this evening? And then SET can have like different answers. It can say, well, you're here because you're A-motivated. Well, perhaps most people who are not here are A-motivated to be here. Because if you don't have any motivation at all, it's very unlikely that you do anything, right? You just sit and wait. Perhaps if you think of students uh, perhaps having a fear for exams and they're just like startling reflex, like, I don't know what I have to do, that is a motivation. You don't know what to do, you don't want to do it, you don't do anything. So you're not motivated at all. Or you could be here because of extrinsic motivation, because it's much expected from you, from uh, your rector or director, and so you just have to be here. Extrinsic motivation, you're not doing the activity for the activity itself, you do something to get something from it. Or you can sit here because you think it might be interesting or fun. So that's intrinsic motivation. Yeah? And what SET found out when it, the theory developed is that, okay, most, for most activities, a lot of people have some kind of intrinsic motivation. Right? You work or you start doing your work, perhaps, because you like doing it. But what SET found out is that if we start paying people for the things they really like to do, they tend to lose their intrinsic motivation. And that's rather bizarre, that's rather strange. They found that in uh, experimental designs, but if you look in your own personal life, you might also find some examples. For example, I like gardening a lot, so I gardened also the garden of my neighbor, <laughs> until he started giving me like small rewards. Oh, Pena, do you come and drink with us? Oh, do you, uh, I have some pizzas, do you want to, to join us at the table and stuff like that? And he, he started rewarding me, and then sometimes he tended to forget the rewards. Like last weekend, <laughs> it was like, okay, but I don't really feel like doing this because I, I don't want the pizzas. I, I don't like pizzas that much, actually. So I'll do my own garden and have my own food and not do the gardening anymore. So I lost my intrinsic motivation. And that's what SET is also all about. If you start giving extrinsic motivation to intrinsically motivated people, there might be something wrong or something strange. But luckily, it's not for every type of extrinsic motivation. And that's where SET really has its added value. This SET makes a difference between different types of motivation, particularly between different types of extrinsic motivation. The theory still acknowledges that people can be not motivated, they're helpless, hopeless, no activity at all. And the theory also still acknowledges that people can be intrinsically motivated. Something is fun or interesting. And then you have all different types of extrinsic motivation. And then a question. Why do I stand here? Because I'm A motivated? Because I'm, no, okay. Am I standing here because others expect it from me? Did I prepare my lecture well because uh, Ian would yeah, give me a compliment when I do well or look and frown at me when I don't? Huh? He's giving me bad rewards or uh, punishments? Did I prepare well because I didn't want to feel guilty for you offering your evening uh, to be here? 
So I really needed to prepare well because otherwise I would be ashamed standing here. Am I standing here because I think it's very important to share SDT with you and to see what you can take from it? Is it that I see myself as a motivational psychologist and I want, just want to share um, all that kind of uh, information and help on this theory? So it's really part of who I am and I really would like to share that with you. Or is it because I like talking about intrinsic motivation and I like to talk about it a lot? So every opportunity I just cross with, it's just a lot of fun to do. So these are different types of motivation, as it is. But each of those types might have different consequences. And we started with differentiating the different types of motivation, but as it is not that complicated. It says that, okay, if you have this type of motivation, if I do something because others would reward me, or I do something because then I can reward myself, then I'm controlled. I do that to please somebody else, uh, to please, to, to have like a pleasurable feelings. Or I can do something because it's interesting or fun, or because I think it's important or really fits who I am. And then I want to do things, me, myself. And then I, it, we call it uh, autonomous motivation. And importantly, this is not about having fun the whole day. Now we can also be autonomous motivated to willing to do things that are not fun. Then, if you want to have a good motivation to do that, it's about identification or integration. Just think about changing diapers. Changing diapers, it's not fun, but as a parent you do it autonomously. You do it because you really want to do it, because you think it's important to take care of your child. Right? And then you have a good type of motivation. And that's totally different from being controlled if you have to do things. Well, and then you can uh, ask like, okay, this is the concept, these are the concepts. But can we also measure this? And can we also measure that among employees? Do those different types of motivation really exist? Well, together with some colleagues, we engaged in a, a development of a questionnaire which was immediately tested in different countries. And uh, we indeed found that people can be intrinsically motivated, can be identified, do, some, they do their work because they think it's important. Some of them also do their work because uh, yeah, they will feel guilty or ashamed or only feel proud if they uh, put effort in their job. And it can also be externally regulated, uh, both because you want to please others, like a social reward, or because you want to have a high wage, for example. And that's a material uh, pressure you can put on yourself. And unfortunately, some people are also amotivated. So there's a questionnaire, so we can measure which type of motivations our employees have. And this is, if you want to have a quick look, this is how it looks like. So uh, I'm happy to share the slides with you so you can do some self-assessment if you want. And I really hope you're in the bottom line, like identified and intrinsic, so autonomous, like doing the things at work because you want to do them. And not so much controlled, like interjected or external because you feel pressured to do so. Right? But does it make a difference? you think? Does your motivation really make a difference in how you feel and what you do? So let me uh, uh, give you like a small example. This is an example of motivating children, but I'd like to share it with you because it's really basic and it really might give you an idea what it's all about. So just imagine um, there's a teacher and she wants her toddlers to paint. And some of the toddlers can paint whatever, the, the paint is just there and they can just start, there are no rules, no regulations. And that's okay if you have one kid, but if you have a whole classroom of kids and you just paint whatever they want, that can become a little bit complicated. So the teacher also has two groups in which she gives rules and regulations. One group is an autonomous motivated group and one group is a controlled group. And I would like you to think what kind of uh, motivation she would like to uh, elicit in her students in this case. So it's about uh, you have to keep the painting materials clean, you can only paint on the smaller sheets, not on the bigger one, so behave like a big girl or, or a, a nice girl and don't mess up. Right? Which type of motivation is she eliciting? Well, it's about controlled motivation. It's you should, you're only a good girl or a good boy if you do this and this. The other group, she gives some instructions like this. It's about, oh, sorry. 
It's about, well, I know it's not always fun to be clean if you start to uh, paint, but now it's really the time to try your best because if you don't mess up the colors, you can paint with uh, the blue and the gray uh, the whole evening or the whole time, and otherwise colors get mixed up and you end up with only brown, right? So she acknowledges the feelings of the students and she also gives a reason why she asks things. And this is what happens. So who do you think would perform best? children who can play without any rules or regulations, the children who can play out of controlled motivation, or can paint but have controlled motivations to be tidy, or a group that have autonomous motivation to be tidy. Who will perform best? Well, if you are into numbers, here are the results. And the numbers that share a letter, they are the same as statistical differentiation. And if you don't want to look at the numbers, here are the figures. And what has been shown is that the group which has no regulations is very comparable to the group who has autonomous rules and regulations. So the group who can freely play, freely paint, did perform as well as a group who had autonomous regulations, but the classroom would be much tidier, right? So you can ask people to do particular things, and if you can ask it in an autonomous, motivating way, they feel much better, they perform much better than if you would ask the same rules or regulations in a controlled way. Even more, they would be as uh, happy as performing if they could just do whatever they want. And it shows for persistence, how long they are painting. It shows for pleasure, how much fun they have. Uh, not for creativity, there the no rules uh, was a little bit better. But for technique, uh, do they paint with uh, uh, people with five fingers or only three and stuff like that. And also use of colors. So motivating really makes a difference whether you do it in a controlled way or in an autonomous way. But this is of course just for students. Does it also work in adults? We are not crazy, right? We can see through those different types of motivation. Well, this is a study I tested uh, myself among a group of uh, adults who are very difficult to motivate sometimes. I think unemployed people. And uh, what we wanted to do is see, um, oh no, I'm sorry. Uh, what we wanted to do here is see whether autonomous and controlled motivation also made a difference uh, in um, employed workers here. The unemployed things, I keep it for later on. Okay, so what we did is here we looked at their controlled motivation and autonomous motivation, and we looked at the exhaustion part of burnout and fear, how much energy they have. And on top of just examining the impact of motivation, we also had a theoretical question, like does the motivation also make a difference on a theoretical level? Can we explain workaholism through those different types of motivations? You know, workaholics, people who work long hours, excessive work, but they not only work long hours, they also have a compulsion to work. Like it's weekend, but they still feel, hmm, I should be working now, right? So a kind of controlled motivation we thought. And what we found is that autonomous motivation really helps in not feeling burnout, in not feeling exhausted, and it really helps in having a lot of energy at work. While controlled motivation was only related to exhaustion, and controlled motivation really predicted how compulsive people were, how much they really had the feeling I have to work and keep on working although I'm not at work. And that then further exhausted them. While autonomous motivation, interestingly enough, no relation with compulsive, but a positive relation with excessive work. So people who are autonomously motivated, they enjoy working, they still can work long hours, but just because it's fun and that it's not exhausting. So yes, autonomous and controlled motivation makes a difference at work. And there's a whole overview of studies in which we show that uh, autonomous and controlled motivation makes a difference for employee well-being, for how positive, how much positive attitudes they have at work. So if you want to commit uh, the professors to the university, autonomous and motivation, uh, autonomous and controlled motivation they can make a difference. If you also want to perform well, it's good to look at what does really motivate me in a good way in my job, because then performance will come automatically. Uh, where does autonomous and controlled motivation come from? Well, some parts are personal, like some people are always or more intended to be autonomous motivated, other people's more tend to go to the controlled way. But most importantly, and therefore I listed all the things that have been examined, it's also very uh, much impacted by the environment. 
like, work, are you working in a good team? How is your supervisor? Do you have the materials to work with? And stuff like that. And what I like to do, if I have a theory, I like to look at the boundaries of it. That's my rebel uh, side, I think. Like, SET is a very nice theory, but I always want to look at, hmm, when does the theory, when is the theory not valid anymore? And this uh, study has taken quite some time, I think five years, uh, until it was published, so it takes a while. And most importantly, it was very difficult because I had some arguments with well, one of my advisors. It's not Hans, don't look at him. <laughs> um, but it's really looking at the boundary conditions of SAT. And I was wondering, like, okay, autonomous and controlled motivation, it has an impact. Uh, that's something we saw already. But at work, we like to be paid. Right, uh, because at the groceries I can't pay with a smile either. So <laughs> I like my wage, but that's a kind of controlled motivation. And I also like my boss giving me a compliment when I perform well. But that's also part of controlled motivation. And of course, I sometimes, most of the times, I have to do the things that my boss requires from me. And that's controlled motivation. So if controlled motivation is just part of working life. Is it then the case that controlled motivation is that negative as one would tell from the literature and as at that point in time? So what we did is really try to look at, okay, what are the boundary conditions of controlled motivation? Is it always that bad? And the second uh, aspect we looked at is, perhaps you knew or you sensed it when I was talking about my motivations to be here, I could have had all those different types of motivation to stand here or to prepare well. I could prepare well because I wanted to please Ian and all the others here. Uh, I could also have work because I think it's important and I also can have work because I think it's fun. These are not exclusive motivations. So that's another thing we, we tapped into. Can people have different motivations at the same time and then does it work differently or not? Okay, let's see what we found. In a Dutch sample and two uh, samples um, within the work. And we choose two samples in the work context, one lower educated call center employees and one higher educated uh, uh, employees as well. And what did we do? We thought, well, perhaps there might be four different groups. There might be people who are high in autonomous and high in control. There might be people who only have autonomous motivation and no control. There might be people who mostly put effort in their job because out of control motivation. And unfortunately, we also thought there were people who were not motivated at all. And this is also what we found in the data sets of each of them. And could you guess how high, uh, what the percentage were of all those groups? What would you think? Would most people be amotivated? Like no motivation at all? Would most people have both motivations? Or it must be only autonomous or mostly only controlled? What do you think? Well, here are the results. To my pleasure, we saw that about 30% of the sample is in a high, high condition, and another 30 is in the autonomous condition. So a lot of people really have the good motivations at work. So that's good news, I think. Like there are a lot of people who are having the good motivations. Does it make an impact? Does it make an impact on their well-being? Well, that's another thing we examined. So we really went into how satisfied are they with their job, how enthusiastic are they, and how much strain do they uh, experience. And then we examined the basic assumption from SDT compared to the basic assumption in most motivational theories. Most motivational theories would say the high, high condition they have tons of motivation. They have both autonomous and controlled motivation, so they have the most motivation. So if they are most motivated, so they must have most well-being. Well, as it is, <coughs> say, no, 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 it's the autonomous condition because, and here are the boundary conditions of controlled motivation, controlled motivation is a bad type of motivation, so it's better to be very low on that aspect of motivation, while being high on autonomous is a very good thing. So, according to SAT, this group should score much higher than this group. Right. What do you see? From the numbers, or from the bars, you see that the condition, the high, high condition, and the autonomous motivated condition, they score as high on well-being, as high on job satisfaction, almost as high on work 
enthusiasm and as low on strain compared to the two others, compared to the control in low, low condition. So my conclusion, and that's where the discussion with my advisor really started, as long as you have autonomous motivation, it's not so problematic to have some controlled motivation as well. As long as you think, you, you truly think that your job is fun, interesting, or important, it's okay to do what your boss wants, because you also want it. Right? So controlled motivation, it's not that problematic, but if you're a manager or if you're a supervisor, don't put too much effort in it, because it also doesn't really help. It's not helpful to have uh, a controlled motivation on top of autonomous motivation. If you have to put some effort somewhere, just try to get everybody on the autonomous side. So that's enough to do. So looking at the boundary conditions really gave interesting discussions, uh, but also an interesting study. So if you would sum things up, there's a saying, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people together to collect wood, and don't assign them tasks and work and things they have to do but rather teach them to long for the endless immersity of the sea. Just let them feel like, okay, I really want to build this ship because it's fun, interesting, and important to me, and then they will flourish. We already had the two aspects I think are one uh, about the most important things of SET. We had SET looks at people from the donkey view, very active, growth-oriented, and in interaction with the environment. And we also had autonomous motivation is much more important than control motivation if you want to have people to flourish at work. Now we move on to the third aspect, and that's about what do people strive for in the future? Intrinsic goals or extrinsic goals? So here it gets a little bit confusing, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. We left those terms aside, we replaced them by autonomous and controlled motivation. But now we are recycling this as it is with all the new stuff, so recycling. Uh, but now it's about the goals, what you want to reach in the future. And then I have some questions for you. Why did Zuma apply for being re-elected? Is it that he wants to have the status of being a president? Or is it because he generally believes he can make a difference for a lot of people here in South Africa? Why do pop stars do what they do? Is it because they want to make a lot of money by making good songs and selling a lot of CDs? Or is it because they generally want to have their fans experience a nice, uh, have a nice experience while listening to the songs? Why do people do research? Why do people come here and apply for or uh, become extraordinary professors? Well, there are various different reasons why people can do what they do, what they're striving for in the future. And SET differentiates intrinsic from extrinsic fairness. And intrinsic fairness all have to do with other people and a generally relationship with other people as well as with yourself. It's about growth. And you can grow yourself and strive for self-development, but you can also have like a growth towards other people. And then you strive for good social relationships, and then you strive for community control. Also, health is included here, but I think in the uh, work context, health is perhaps less important or less a goal to strive for to have through work. You can also have extrinsic values. And extrinsic values all have to do about being ahead of other people, using other people to get ahead. It has to do about wealth, being financially successful. It has to do with fame, with image. And why are they called intrinsic and extrinsic? Well, SET considers that the intrinsic values really fit with the donkey view of uh, who people are. They really have to do with being growth-oriented and active. So it's about growth, yourself, and towards others. And that's why it really aligns with the positive growth in a tendency people have from nature on. That's why it's intrinsic to who we really are, to our potential. It has to do with true self-esteem, you can be whoever you want, and it's about being. People who know uh, the work from might be familiar with that concept. Extrinsic values, in contrast, really have to, are extrinsic towards the growth orientation we really have. It has also frustrates that growth orientation, and it gives you a very fragile self-esteem. 
I can only be the person who I am as long as the others grant me the money, as long as others really grant me the status. So it gives you a fragile self-esteem. It's about acquiring more and more wealth uh, and status. So there is a difference between those different values. Intrinsic values are set to uh, enhance flourishing, while extrinsic values really frustrate uh, people's flourishing at work. And it has, again, to do with well-being, attitudes, and behavior. So, if you want to motivate people, you might want to stress intrinsic values rather than extrinsic values. Is there evidence for that? Well, I promised to look at unemployed people, and here is uh, something I did uh, while doing my internship. So it's about the intrinsic and extrinsic values of unemployed people. And again, uh, we also looked at, do those intrinsic and extrinsic values also make a difference on top of having goals? Like, having goals in life is important, but does it matter whether the core of those goals is intrinsic or extrinsic? So we had some um, unemployed people uh, in a Belgian sample, and we looked at um, employment value and intrinsic and extrinsic values. And we looked at how flexible people are in the context of uh, their unemployment. But if you're unemployed, the first day you're unemployed, you're perhaps a little bit relaxing, right? It has been hard on my job, so my first day is a little bit of holiday. Then after a while, you start searching. Most people start searching. And they search for their ideal job. And I learned this week already that for most people here in South Africa, an ideal job is become a lawyer or an IT people, or a person or whatever. Like, a good job. This is really what I would like to find. But if you don't find that job, you might want or you might need to become a little bit flexible. To step aside from your ideal, your dream job, and perhaps do a little bit different thing. And that's what flexibility is all about. Training flexibility is about, okay, I want to attend additional training to become what I would really like. You can also be flexible in the amount of pay you want, or you can become flexible like, okay, for the next coming months, I do a job which is a little bit boring, it doesn't really require much from me, but at least I'm at work and I can keep on searching. Or you can really uh, accept a job which is uh, lower than your qualifications, your study, or your previous experience. And what we found is that uh, the more people value being employed, the more they are flexible in every possible uh, way we measure it. So they are flexible. Right. That's nice. Right. But do you want to be flexible in accepting an undemanding job? Do you want to be flexible if you have a master's degree in accepting a job which doesn't require any education? Because it might be um, dangerous to do that. Because when you start in that kind of low-skilled job, it's very hard to uh, do the things you really studied for after all. It's a kind of trap you do. So not every type of flexibility might be that good. And if we then look at the color of our values, at the color of our goals, we can see that intrinsic-oriented people really make different choices than extrinsic-oriented. Our intrinsic-oriented people, the people with intrinsic value orientation, they say, oh, bring it on, additional education. Yes, that's something I want to develop myself a little bit further to get the job I really want. And if I'm not paid that much for that ideal job, okay, that's life. It will be okay. It's not being underpaid, it's being paid a little bit less, right? It's, you can still uh, serve yourself and, and support your family. Extrinsic-oriented people, on the other hand, they're still striving for their ideal job, and they don't want to invest, they don't want to uh, attend additional training, and no way I'm going to accept a job that doesn't pay that high. So even though they are uh, offered a job, when it pays less well than they would have expected, they are not going to take it. It really frustrates their wish to find employment. So intrinsic values of really help unemployed people to really get a job which is good for them in the long term, a job which will require a lot of qualifications. But that's for unemployed people, right? If you're then in a job, do your values still matter? Well, this is a study, um, mostly my one of my advisors did, and uh, I uh, was lucky enough to uh, contribute a little bit. And this is about intrinsic and extrinsic values among community workers. 
we asked like which values do you uh, pursue the next coming months and they had to think of whether they were intrinsic and extrinsic. And what we see here is that the more you pursue extrinsic values at the expense of intrinsic ones, so the more in extrinsic values you have um, and the less intrinsic ones, it gives you less job satisfaction, less engagement, more burnout, more turnover intention, and more difficulty in combining your work life with your family life. So extrinsic values, even though you are employed, really don't help you in flourishing because they are detrimental to your well-being, to your attitudes, and so on and so forth. So why on earth do we still pursue extrinsic values? Well, the secret is in here. It gives us short-lived satisfaction. And that's measured really with the item. How many times do you experience you're really happy, you really enjoy things, uh, but that feeling soon wanes? People with extrinsic values are in that kind of treadmill. They strive to have those extrinsic rewards, and once they have it, their happiness wanes. And then they have to strive for the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So it's a kind of addiction. So it doesn't bring us well-being flourishing in the long term, but it gives us those little shots of so-called happiness, hedonic happiness, uh, but those feelings quickly uh, go away. So intrinsic values, striving for intrinsic values, really helps you to uh, have positive job-related outcomes. Does it only help us immediately, or does it also help us to look different at the environment? Now, this is a study I did together with uh, Hans and with uh, some colleagues from the Netherlands. We really went into the question whether striving for particular values also helped us at looking differently at the context, at the organization. And what we did is uh, we looked again at exhaustion or burnout and engagement, the values, and we looked at which resources are there in the environment. <coughs> and resources can be very broad, and what we looked at is first how much autonomy do you have in your job, how much can you decide for yourself, and how much learning opportunities do you have, how much opportunities do you see to, to develop yourself. Having the possibility to attend the course on UNPLUS, for example, could be a learning opportunity, but also engaging in new projects at work could be a learning opportunity. So what did we do? We examined the autonomy and the learning opportunities and had some controlled var control variables like job demands, having lots of work to do, uh, having emotional demands, for example, your students who come and complain, that's an emotional demand. And what we found is that the more you have intrinsic values, the more you see autonomy and learning opportunities, and the more you make use of those autonomy, well, possibilities for being autonomous and those learning opportunities and perhaps mostly the latter. So if we have a look here, then you can see that people who have high learning opportunities in their job and combine it with high intrinsic values, well, they are really uh, able to use those learning opportunities to offset uh, emotional exhaustion, which might be caused by the workload they're experiencing. So if you see, hmm, there might be an opportunity to engage in this project, then you are less exhausted and this feel better uh, in your work. So it also helps in a very particular way, not only straightforward, but also because you look different at the environment. But are there also intrinsic and extrinsic values in the environment? Could an organization also signal intrinsic and extrinsic values? Well, together with a colleague, uh, I thought it could. Because there is some research on that uh, parents' values or teacher values really impact on how students or children look at their environment. If your uh, mom or dad would stress, okay, you just grow up and be, uh, try to develop yourself or try to contribute to the community, then you grow up in a totally different environment than when your parent or your teacher would say, you really have to study well because in the end you will become wealthy or rich or um, you have a lot of status. Right? So we thought, could we take that research also to the context of work? Is it the case that, for example, in a university, in a company, intrinsic values are more prevalent than extrinsic values or the other way around? And we looked at employability 
Employability is really the research topic of my colleagues, so that's also sometimes how it goes. I have a topic, she had a topic, and we combined the uh, research interests. And employability is about how many job opportunities do you see? And you can see a lot of uh, opportunities with the same employer, or you can see a lot of opportunities at different employers, in this university or in the labor market at large. And you can see similar jobs as a professor, as a rector, as a director, or you can see better jobs. I can make a promotion. And then you end up with four different types of employability. And what do you think that uh, the values would predict? Well, depending on the values that are prevalent in the organizations, people develop different thoughts about possibilities for themselves. And as an employer, you would like people to develop themselves, but you don't want them to see a lot of opportunities at another employer, right? Because you want to keep them, especially when they're good. So what does our research show? That if you, as an organization, support self-development, community contributions, social relationships, your people will see a lot of opportunities, similar jobs in your company, they also will, so, will see better jobs in your company and have the feeling that if I would apply, I would get them. So that also keeps them with you as an employer. Well, if you pursue status and power and financial success, people don't see many job opportunities, they feel trapped, and particularly they see little opportunities in your company. So if you want to flourish as an organization, it's better to stress intrinsic values rather than extrinsic. Because intrinsic values really help employees to see other possibilities within the company so they have the feeling that, yeah, I can have a future here. While if you pursue extrinsic values as an organization, people hardly see any opportunities. And they feel trapped. If we then move on to values of the company, then you can ask another question. Okay. But if my people have particular values, and me as an organization, I see no particular values, don't there have to be a fit between people? Like, if people really become, want to become rich and uh, famous, isn't it better that I attract those uh, people in my organization where I think also think, as an employer, that becoming rich and famous is important? For those people, that must work, right? Yes, then we are in an environment that they also want. We weren't uh, yet lucky enough to uh, publish those results. Uh, that will be for a uh, next opportunity. Uh, but we already examined this among unemployed again. So what we did is we asked the values of the unemployed, and we asked which values do you see signaled in organizations where you're going to apply. And now we examined, okay, what does matter more? Personal values of the unemployed, the values of the organization, or does there have to be a match? So, intrinsic values, extrinsic values, or a match. It doesn't really matter which color your values have, as long as they have the same values as uh, for the individual and for the organization. There's a fit. Well, if we look at the results, we looked at how much effort do they do, how hard do they try to find a job, how motivated are they? How much do they expect to find a job? And how much is that job worth to them? And uh, how many uh, discrete behaviors did they do to get the job? And discrete behaviors are, for example, do you ask feedback for your CV? Do you look for additional information? And so on and so forth. And I already gave you a sneak preview. If we look at the personal values, then you can see that interest people who uh, have intrinsic values, they are really putting the effort in the behaviors. They are really looking for additional information, going uh, out and asking for feedback and stuff like that. So they're really trying hard. Interestingly, and not in line with SDT, uh, to the contrary, people with extrinsic values, they say, I'm highly motivated for this job. And we're not quite sure how we should interpret it might be the case that they say, I try, I'm really motivated, because they try to, or they tend to overestimate their possibilities of getting the job. Because they expect to get the job, but that's not quite sure they will really get it. But that's just an interpretation, this is ongoing work. What about the organizational values? 
they matter. And it's particularly the intrinsic organizational values that really attract people. If you signal as an organization that you uh, value community contribution, social relationships, and self-development, people will feel attracted. They will uh, put a lot of effort in it, are highly motivated, and really also show that motivation in their behavior. So in line with what we have found in uh, teachers, in families, pursuing of our signal and intrinsic um, values is really important in a context. So what about the fit? We only found one uh, part of evidence for fit. And then we can see that people, unemployed people, pursuing extrinsic values, if they apply for an extrinsically oriented organization, they tend to be, again, more motivated. So we don't really notice about the expectancy, perhaps, that they think, like, hmm, I will get a job in this organization. Um, but importantly, they don't put more effort in, it, in the terms of the discrete behaviors. If you want to look at this, yeah, it's I have high personal extrinsic values, and I apply for a job which signals a lot of extrinsic values. Then they say they're more motivated, but uh, as I uh, sum it up there, that might be because of the measurement of uh, motivation. To cut things short, it's not the fit, really. If you think it's about the intrinsic values of the organization, that better coefficients were much higher than the interaction, and for each of the uh, outcomes it was relevant. So really, having intrinsic values as an organization is very important for people to flourish, and also for unemployed people who might be attracted. So if you want to attract good professors as a uh, university, intrinsic values are important. If you want to stimulate your students, uh, uh, showing intrinsic values yourself is very much important. I promised four things, and the evening is uh, going smoothly and further on, and I have only one thing left. But this is really a thing that uh, is really in my heart. It's really uh, one of the things I study most, and I think it's very valuable, and that's a basic need satisfaction. This is really the things that give you energy. And if I can ask you a new question, and I would like to close your eyes, it's late in the evening already, but no, don't fall asleep. <laughs> and I would like to ask you, to think of a situation in which you felt exceptionally well, in which you had the feeling, this is truly me. I have tons of energy and I can carry the world. Is there anyone who wants to share that experience? Okay. Everybody can open his or her eyes. If I do this exercise, what I mostly get is the ABC of SDT. When I tell this to managers, they were like, whoa, there's an ABC. <laughs> this is the right? um, but SDT is really, our, mm. uh, the ABC is really about autonomy, belongingness, sometimes also called relatedness, but you have to sacrifice something to get the ABC. Mm. And then also confidence. And if you have those three things, that really gives you the nutrients that really give you the psychological flourishing. As much as plants need water, sunshine, and minerals, people need uh, A, B, and C to flourish from a psychological point of view. And what is that A, B, C? Well, I don't think we have much trouble with the B and the C. So let me start with those. Belongingness. We want to relate to other people. We want to have friends even at work or at least good relationships. We want to be part of a team, um, to care for others, and to be cared for. If we have that, if we have such a nice team, such nice colleagues, we will flourish, right? Much more than if you're feeling rather alone at work. The next one, competence. If you feel you can do things at work, which you can really do, which you're confident with, then you will also flourish more and when day in, day out, you enter work with the idea like, oh my god, there's a new group of students and I have no clue how to handle them, right? That doesn't give you much force. And then the A, which is perhaps a little bit tricky, and this is very important. For SDT, the A is all about are you psychologically free, in the sense that do you stand behind your behaviors? 
I don't know whether the word also runs in South Africa, but in Belgium, in Flemish, it's called, you do things with a lot of hoosting, with a lot of energy, like, hmm, yeah, this is okay. This is what I want to do. And that doesn't mean you have to be independent. That doesn't mean you are the one deciding what to do. For example, I didn't decide to put on this rope, right? It's something I, I didn't have any say in. I could give some measurements, but yeah, that was it, right? But I'm really proud to wear it, because I see this is part of a long tradition. And I hope the tradition will continue for a long time as well. So although I didn't choose it, I'm more than psychological free. I do it with more than hosting to be here and share my story with you. You see? So that's autonomy. It's not about independence. It's not, it's not about I decide for my own. But I see how much value it has, and I do it with, I'm okay with it. Does it really matter that A, B, C, those new trimmers? Well, let us see. I made a questionnaire in my uh, PhD to really tap in the ABC. And if you want to have, again, a self-assessment, here are the questions. I don't think they're translated yet into Afrikaans, but uh, some people in Spain are, for example, busy with uh, working it uh, through for unemployment. So there are lots of things. Uh, you can do it also for students. There are questionnaires available. I think also in different languages here. Does it matter? Well, the ABC is really important to really move on from I have to do things, the control motivation, to the autonomous motivation. I want to do things. The needs are also important to really develop those intrinsic values, to develop the sense that you want to contribute to the community, relate to others, and develop yourself. So it works both ways. If you have your needs satisfied, you're more than likely to really make that donkey view happen. Right? to be energetic and to strive for the right goals and to have the autonomous motivation. And being in that part of your life where you are autonomous, striving for intrinsic values, also gives you a lot of need satisfaction. So that's a positive treadmill. And not an hedonic one, not a one that only lasts for five minutes, eh, like eating chocolates, but uh, a eudaimonic one that will last. On the other hand, if your needs are frustrated, you tend to go into the control motivation. Uh, if you have like um, 100 papers to march at 12 o'clock, your needs are not satisfied anymore, and it's like, I have to mark them still, right? It's not a ton of us, and sometimes, yeah, it takes some energy, some additional energy to really see the autonomous motivation again. Same for the values. So it's uh, a relationship that's visible. If you want to have a further look into it, uh, it's really important that those identified and integrated, the importance which is in both, that really satisfies each of the needs. While intrinsic motivation is a little bit tricky. I can enjoy reading a book very much, but I forget everyone around me. So not each of the needs might be the satisfied there. But that's a little bit more Does it work? Autom uh, the need, basic need satisfaction? Again, we tested it in a sample which people sometimes frown upon, like a, B, and C, like autonomy, Ooh, competence, belongingness. For people in the call center, they don't need much, they just need clear instructions, right? No. These results show that the ABC really helps people to thrive, both when they are highly educated, like our HR workers, but also when they are working just in the call center, when they uh, do low skill jobs, so called low skill jobs. Those needs also work with. Uh, the uh, values, yes, we get need satisfaction, explains, remember you, our community workers, uh, with extrinsic values leading to less job satisfaction, less engagement, and so on and so forth. This is the second part of the study in which we show that need satisfaction really can explain why those extrinsic values do what they do, why they have their negative value. If we then move on, then we can see that it's not only beneficial to stimulate the basic needs, to stimulate the ABC, not only for motivation and values, but also for tons of other things. Job satisfaction, having energy, vigor, exhaustion, life satisfaction even, so having your needs satisfied at work helps you to be more content with your life as well. Also organizational commitments and also performance, so employers have all reasons to really tap into the basic needs of their employees, to make them 
uh, feel autonomous, like, hmm, I do this with a lot of uh, psychological freedom, I really want to engage in this, we have a good team, like feeling uh, related to others, and feeling comfortable. That's really important. And need satisfaction also uh, can not only be stimulated by employers by directly, but I also tapped into uh, how can the context really uh, help people in having their needs satisfied. And this is also the study Ian referred to, it was my master thesis a long time ago. Um, and this is uh, where we really went into can need ex uh, satisfaction explain the impact of how my job looks like. And there is a model, the job demands resources model, uh, which uh, has a particular view on how jobs look like. And it's actually a very basic, simple, mo a very basic model. Just think of some things that are really make your job annoying. Lots of work to do. People who can come and complain, emotional demands. Having to think the whole day, which is kind of demanding, right? Cognitive demands. And having lots of trouble to combine your job with your family life. That also makes your job annoying, difficult, and those are difficult aspects. These, these are hurdles, job demands. But there are also a lot of jobs, uh, job aspects that give you energy, that are resources. And those resources can be support. If your colleagues ask you on Monday morning, hey, how was your weekend? Or if you have to have a defense or something like that, if you have to defend an ethics, uh, committee, for an ethics committee, and your colleagues ask like, how, how did it go? That's social support, that's a resource. If you get feedback, if you get autonomy, if you can use your skills, <coughs> these are all resources, right? And the job demands resources model says that all the things that require energy, all those job demands, they're exhausting, but they're needing to burn. While all resources give you lots of energy, vigor, engagement. And, importantly, they also help you um, to offset burnout. If you have lots of resources, you're less likely to burn out. Can the needs explain those relationships? That was our question. Do the needs, us essential nutrients, really can explain those relationships? Is it that we have to look in the job for those aspects that satisfy the A, B, and C? And then we found evidence for this assumption. We found that if you have lots of job resources, you feel nourished in your basic needs. You really have the ABC. That's okay. And then you have little exhaustion, no exhaustion, and a lot of fear. Job demands, on the other hand, they frustrate the basic needs, and therefore they exhaust you. There is also still a direct relationship, so it's still working on that. But most importantly, resources satisfy your basic needs, while job demands do the opposite, and are therefore detrimental. But it's not only job characteristics that can be explained by basic needs. Also, one aspect in a job that's very important and very stressful, and that's job insecurity. And this is an article that just got, got accepted um, a while ago, just got accepted like last year. And here we are going to look at uh, job insecurity, and job insecurity in the sense that are you scared you will lose your job? Lose your job because you're fired. It's not you who went to uh, look for another job, but when you're fired. Does it also impact on the basic needs? Are basic needs that important? Yes, they are. And insecurity really taps into the A, B, and C. So if you feel that your job is at stake, you don't know what to do anymore. You don't feel competent anymore. You also don't feel that related. You don't feel that you can be part of your team anymore. And so your psychological freedom also goes well. Away. And this is the article I would like uh, also to show very quickly because it got accepted only yesterday and I'm very happy with that. Um, it's about uh, also insecurity, but not about losing your job. It's insecurity that you cannot do the same job anymore. That the type of your job will change. You will change teams, you will change tasks you have to do and stuff like that. And it's unwanted. It's not that you're being promoted or you ask for other projects. No, you are asked to do things or forced to do things. And then that might also impact on your basic needs and therefore become different. There are tons of other stuff, uh, other uh, aspects that can be explained by basic need satisfaction, but they are for the future. And the future can be that um, 
we look more into basic needs satisfaction. How can it help people uh, to flourish at work? How can we tap more into those intrinsic and extrinsic values? We need questionnaires for that. Also think uh, we look we have to look more in the impact of organizational values, for example. We also have lots of work to do with autonomous and control motivation. We look, for example, into well-being, but what with performance, because our employers also want us to perform well, right? So there are a lot of things we still can do. And there is also a lot of reading we can still do. So I hope to give they have given you the spark of this motivational theory. And if you want to have further readings, there are some websites, there are some overviews you could uh, have a look at. And if you don't like reading when it's late in the evening or you just want to watch television, you can perhaps uh, look at this um, uh, person. He has both a TED talk and uh, some other videos on YouTube. And it's Daniel Pink. He's really a marketeer. But he took a lot of aspects from SET and he's just wonderful in explaining it. It's not exactly the theory, but well, he's so enthusiastic uh, that it's very nice to uh, listen to him. And then you will get uh, the majority of the major part of the SET aspect as well. So if you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. So I will be around uh, next coming hours the rest of the week and I hope to be here in the future as well. So. I'm really intrinsically motivated and also very identified. I'm a motivational psychologist, so very autonomous to answer every question you might have. Thank you very much for your time.